on World News Tonight. Surprising deal. Opposing superpowers reach common ground on climate conservation. Mending ties. France and America put aside their differences for progressive conversation. Grim warnings. Europe overflows with infection as the WHO predicts imminent doom. Ho, ho, ho. Seasonal greetings from a certain bearded man as Israel prepares for Christmas. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thanks for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with the growing climate crisis talks. In a surprising turn of events at the COP26 climate summit, Washington and Beijing, who seem to be at odds for most of the two-week talks in Glasgow, announced that they will beef up efforts to tackle climate change together. Uh, today, the United States and China are releasing a joint declaration. In a surprise move, the United States and China, the world's two largest emitters of carbon dioxide, on Wednesday unveiled a deal to work together tackling climate change by cutting methane emissions, phasing out coal consumption, and protecting forests. The framework agreement was announced by U.S. climate envoy John Kerry and his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping. First, this declaration includes strong statements about the alarming science, the emissions gap, and the urgent need to accelerate the action to close that gap. This is critical. Second, it commits to a series of important actions, not in the long term, not way out in the future, but now, now during this decade when it's needed. Speaking through an interpreter, Shea told reporters that the deal would see China strengthen its emissions cutting targets and develop a national plan on methane. It was billed by both as a way to tip the UN climate summit towards success. A first draft of the COP26 agreement, released earlier in the day, received a mixed response from climate activists and experts. Almost 200 countries present in Glasgow have until the close of the two-week meeting on Friday to agree to the final text. The overarching goal of the conference is to keep alive hopes of capping global temperatures at 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit above pre-industrial levels, which is far out of reach on the basis of countries' current emissions cutting pledges. The EU climate policy chief told the U.S.-China agreement gave room for hope, adding, quote, it's really encouraging to see that those countries that were at odds in so many areas have found common ground on what is the biggest challenge humanity faces today. The British hosts of COP26 have called on countries to raise their ambitions to cut greenhouse gas emissions by next year, acknowledging that current pledges fall far short of what is needed to avert climate catastrophe. The anger and the impatience of the world. The British hosts of the COP26 UN climate conference in Glasgow have proposed that countries raise their ambitions to slash greenhouse gas emissions by next year in a draft political decision that will be negotiated over the next three days. Climate experts and activists warn of a yawning gap between current pledges and the emissions cuts needed to prevent a full-blown climate crisis. The first draft of the political decision, which the United Nations released on Wednesday, asks countries to revisit and strengthen the 2030 targets in their nationally determined contributions so as to align with the Paris Agreement temperature goal by the end of 2022. That would force countries to set tougher climate targets next year. A key request from countries most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Countries agreed under the Paris Accord to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and to try to cap it at 1.5 degrees. Scientists say crossing the 1.5 degree threshold would unleash even worse sea level rises, floods, droughts, wildfires and storms, and some of the damage might be irreversible. The draft also urged countries to speed up efforts to end fossil fuel subsidies, though it set no fixed date. That proposal could face pushback from big energy producers. You must have your own response, sir. The text also dodges poorer countries' demands for assurances that rich countries, whose greenhouse gas emissions are largely responsible for climate change, will provide far more money to help them cope with climate change and cut CO2 emissions. 
Greenpeace dismissed the draft as an inadequate response to the climate crisis, calling it, quote, a polite request that countries maybe, possibly, do more next year. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris touched down in Paris on a mission to further mend relations with France after a crisis sparked by a cancelled submarine contract. During her four-day visit, her third overseas trip in office, Harris meets with French President Emmanuel Macron and attends a peace forum with other world leaders. Kamala Harris has hit the ground running on her first official trip to France. Her five-day visit is meant to showcase the enduring nature of the U.S.-French alliance. The U.S. Vice President's first stop, the Institut Pasteur in Paris, where she met the American and French researchers working together on the COVID-19 virus. It is also an incredible statement about the history of the relationship between France and the United States on many issues, but in particular on scientific research. Some of the most significant discoveries in science have occurred here in collaboration with French scientists, American scientists, scientists around the world. She's been entrusted by U.S. President Joe Biden to help smooth over ruffled feathers in the wake of the botched handling of the submarine affair. In September, Australia canceled a 60 billion euro deal with France to build submarines in favor of a new deal with the U.S., catching Paris off guard. Since then, Washington has been on a charm offensive to repair the rift. On the sidelines of the G20, Biden acknowledged the announcement could have been handled better. As part of Harris's five-day visit, she'll meet President Emmanuel Macron. They're expected to discuss U.S. support for France's military mission in the Sahel, as well as the climate crisis and the pandemic. Harris will also visit the American cemetery in Suren, make the opening remarks at the Paris Peace Forum, and attend a conference on Libya with other world leaders. A federal judge ruled that a U.S. House of Representatives committee investigating the deadly January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol can access former President Donald Trump's White House records in a win for congressional investigators. Former U.S. President Donald Trump cannot stop January 6th investigators from accessing White House records. That was the decision by a federal court Tuesday in response to Trump's efforts to shield documents about his actions around the Capitol attack. Current President Joe Biden made the decision to release the materials to Congress. It all comes down to a presidential power called executive privilege, which the judge ruled does not apply to Trump anymore, saying presidents are not kings and plaintiff is not president. It's a big win for congressional investigators who hope to determine how much responsibility Trump bears for inciting the insurrection. Trump immediately appealed the court's decision, but the records are set to be delivered by Friday afternoon unless a court intervenes. The congressional committee investigating also said on Tuesday it's issued subpoenas seeking documents and testimony from 10 more of Trump's associates. The list includes former senior advisor Stephen Miller, former press secretary Kayleigh McEnany and other White House aides. The legal setbacks have not stopped Trump from maintaining the 2020 election was stolen from him, a claim he made yet again on Tuesday. The European Union accused Belarus of mounting a hybrid attack by pushing migrants across the border into Poland, paving the way for widened sanctions against minks in a crisis that threatens to draw in Russia and NATO. With Belarus locked in a migrant standoff crisis on its border with the European Union, Russia on Wednesday took the rare step of dispatching two nuclear-capable strategic bombers to patrol Belarusian airspace. And NATO signaled its backing for neighboring Poland. Russia's bold show of support for its ally Belarus comes as European Commission head Ursula von der Leyen during White House meetings on Wednesday confirmed that the EU would widen its sanctions against Belarus. We absolutely share uh, the assessment that this is a hybrid attack of an authoritarian regime to try to destabilize democratic neighbors, and this will not succeed. The EU accuses Minsk of drawing in migrants from the Middle East, Afghanistan, and Africa, and then pushing them to cross into Poland to try to sow violent chaos on the bloc's eastern side. <laughs> Polish government video published Wednesday allegedly shows Belarusian guards leading migrants along the border, and another purporting to show guards confronting migrants. 
Belarus and Russia are pointing fingers at Europe, with the Kremlin accusing the EU of failing to live up to its own humanitarian ideals and trying to strangle Belarus with plans to close part of the frontier. Belarus President Alexander Lukashenko has said he's not trying to escalate the migrant crisis, but said Belarus will not kneel down under pressure. If, God forbid, we make any mistake, if we take a wrong step, then it will instantly drag Russia into this maelstrom, and it's the largest nuclear-armed power. I am not a madman. I understand very well what this could lead to. So there is no valor here. Grab an assault rifle and march to the Polish border. By the way, a place where I used to serve as a border guard. No, surely not. We realize it. We know our place. Amid freezing temperatures, thousands of people have converged on the border this week, where some migrants have complained of being repeatedly pushed back and forth by Polish and Belarusian border guards, putting them at risk of exposure, lack of food and water. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. On to the updates of the COVID pandemic. Europe is once again seeing a surge in COVID-19 cases. An official from the WHO has warned that the continent could see another 500,000 deaths this winter. Countries are desperately trying to increase vaccination rates in an attempt to contain the spike in infections. Europe is gearing up to battle the climb in infections. According to a WHO report on Wednesday, during the first week of November, more than 60 percent of the 3.1 million COVID-19 cases reported worldwide were from Europe. Right now, we are seeing increases where we shouldn't be. There's been a 50, more than 55 percent increase in cases over the last four weeks in Europe, where there's ample supply of vaccines, where there's ample supply of tools. Mike Ryan, head of WHO's emergencies program, said earlier that the combination of East social distancing measures and the drop in temperatures might be feeding into the virus. Hans Kluge, a senior WHO official, warned that Europe has once again become the hotbed of the coronavirus and that 500,000 more COVID-19 deaths may occur by next February. Countries in Europe are taking different approaches to curb the surge. I have concluded that all those working in the NHS and social care will have to be vaccinated. We must avoid preventable harm and protect patients in the NHS, protect colleagues in the NHS and, of course, protect the NHS itself. England has also expanded its vaccination campaign to children as young as 12 and its booster campaign to everyone aged 50 and over. France, meanwhile, has extended its use of vaccine passes to the end of next July. And from 15th of December, people will need proof of a booster shot to extend the validity of their health passes. Switzerland, which has a comparably low vaccination rate, is also employing aggressive tactics to encourage vaccinations. It launched a national vaccination week and has invested 105 million U.S. dollars on mobile vaccination units, information campaigns and series of events to help people get their jabs. One of Germany's top virologists has warned that a further 100,000 people will die from COVID if nothing is done to halt an aggressive fourth wave within the country. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent Inuka Ponzo reporting now from Cleve in Germany. Inuka? Yes, Anuradi. Case numbers have soared and Germany registered its highest rate of infection since the pandemic began with almost 40,000 cases in a day. Doctors in the intensive care COVID ward at Leipzig University Hospital warn this fourth wave would be the worst yet. It also has the lowest take-up of vaccine. 57% of the population here has been vaccinated. Germany's health minister has publicly blamed those people for the soaring cases, describing the current situation as a pandemic of the unvaccinated. 16 million Germans over the age of 12 have not been fully vaccinated. The German government has admitted it's unlikely to persuade many of those people now, and politicians worry that social divisions might deepen. On the intensive care COVID unit, they fear the damage is done. Operations have already been cancelled. Procedures postponed to make way for COVID patients. Back to you, Anuradi. 
All right, thank you. That was Other There in the World News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. One week after becoming eligible, the White House Coronavirus Task Force announced that over 900,000 children ages 5 to 11 have received their first COVID-19 vaccine and another 700,000 already have appointments to get the shot. However, there is still a long way to go with 28 million kids in that age group. The White House Coronavirus Task Force on Wednesday announced that nearly a million children ages 5 to 11 have received their first COVID-19 vaccine since the shot was approved last week. White House COVID-19 coordinator Jeff Zients said pharmacies, pediatricians, hospitals and schools were all stepping up to offer vaccinations. We're off to a very strong start with 900,000 Kids already having received their first shot, 700,000 appointments already scheduled at local pharmacies alone. CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky said while she's gotten feedback from parents grateful the shot has been approved, others have doubts. Still, I hear questions from some parents. Is the vaccine safe? What are the risks of COVID-19? Should I vaccinate my own child? While COVID-19 is not as deadly to young kids as it is to adults, Walensky said COVID-19 is still the largest vaccine-preventable killer of children in that age group, with 66 children ages 5 to 11 dying from it over the past year. She urged caregivers to vaccinate their children. To the 60 million Americans ages 12 and older who are not yet vaccinated, and to the 28 million children, 5 to 11, who are now eligible, I strongly encourage you to roll up your sleeves and get vaccinated today. Many parents across the U.S. are heeding the call. I am beyond excited, and it's more about relief. You know, so many people lost their lives. And now it's time. It's part of getting back into normalcy. Nine-year-old Jax was both nervous and excited about getting the shot in New York Wednesday. See that I could see my grandma and my and my friends and my family. Science said the federal government had purchased enough supply for all 28 million eligible children. Still, it remains unclear how many parents will vaccinate their kids. French President Emmanuel Macron called for an acceleration of COVID-19 booster shots for elderly and vulnerable citizens. But before France, Israel was the first country to vaccinate, then the first to widely implement a booster shot campaign. They were the first country to adopt a third booster vaccine for COVID-19. And on Tuesday, Israel's health minister said that a milestone 4 million out of the 9.5 million population have received their third dose. Whilst the booster rollout began for over 65s, it soon became eligible for all citizens and has been credited with helping overcome Israel's fourth wave. A wide-scale study published last month showed that Israel's third booster jab was 92% effective in preventing serious illness, compared to people who only received two doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. The study's data also showed 81% efficacy in preventing COVID-related deaths, with only seven recorded amongst the participants who got the booster, compared to 44 deaths without. Both trial groups recorded significantly fewer numbers of hospitalizations and deaths than those who hadn't been vaccinated at all. Despite the figures, the government is remaining cautious, citing the unvaccinated and new variants as potential causes. Israel is now debating whether to approve shots for 5 to 11-year-olds, a decision that could be decided in the coming weeks. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The Taiwan government faces 5 million cyber attacks daily, with around half of them believed to be from China. Taiwan has also accused China of ramping up cyber attacks since the 2016 election. Amid the continuing global craze, content related to South Korean show Squid Game has garnered 17 billion views on YouTube, surpassing that of HBO's Game of Thrones. Heavy rains in India's southern Tamil Nadu state have killed at least 14 people, with weather forecasters expecting the downpours to ease in the next few days. President Joe Biden vowed to tackle high consumer prices head-on and assured Americans that companies are working around the clock to ease supply chain issues so that the shelves will be stocked for the holidays. Poppies illuminated the sales of the Sydney Opera House at dawn on the 103rd anniversary of Remembrance Day. A lone bugler played the last post as daylight approached, marking the end of World War I and paying a tribute to those who made the ultimate sacrifice for their country.
And finally tonight, Jerusalem's Santa Claus visited the Sea of Galilee where Jesus walked across the water some 2,000 years ago, according to the Bible, to the open Christmas season in the Holy Land. Israel saw a drop in tourism in the wake of the global COVID-19 pandemic. This event, which was organized by Israel's tourism ministry, began at sunrise when the man behind the beard, Jerusalem's Issachar Saisi, wearing a Santa costume, paddled a kayak, pulling gifts and Christmas trees to bring to the children living in the region. He was later scheduled to visit local wineries and meet a delegation of cyclists. Christmas Eve in the Holy Land will be marked at the Nativity Church in Bethlehem on December 24th in a mass led by Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Suzanne Shanali will join you again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Anuradha Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.